I'm Colin Carroll. I'm a software engineer and data scientist, and the goal of this talk is to offer an invitation to automatic differentiation in Python. These are a collection of algorithms that are readily available and easy to use, and I hope you will use them to write expressive, flexible, and creative programs. Today we're going to start from the beginning to get some intuition for the derivative and its high-dimensional sibling, the gradient, and we're going to show some use cases of automatic differentiation. My real goal for you here, though, is to experiment and have fun. Python is a joyful language, and there are a number of libraries available that make auto-differentiation a joy to use. The background of this slide is actually a fun spiral I've cooked up on the right-hand side, and the derivative of that spiral on the left. I think computational art is very fun, and automatic differentiation is an extra tool to use. So we start off talking about the derivative. The derivative of a function is the rate of change of that function. The idea turns out to be important in science. For example, efficient algorithms for maximizing or minimizing functions using the derivative are central to machine learning in general and deep learning in particular. Speaking broadly, the derivative provides far more information than the function alone. It's the difference between knowing that your friend is at Grand Central Station and knowing that your friend is at Grand Central Station heading north. We should start with what is a numeric program in Python, since these will be the inputs to automatic differentiation. All a numeric program is, is one that has numbers go in and have numbers come out. The input can be one or more numbers, but for most automatic differentiation programs, the output ought to be a single number. If we have one input and one output, we can look at a graph of these functions. Specifically, we put the input on the x-axis and the output on the y-axis, that's the vertical axis. This is a function f of x is equal to x squared, so I'm just squaring each input. 2 turns into 4, negative 3 turns into 9. To make the graph, there are too many real numbers to evaluate our function everywhere, but we can just evaluate it at 50 or 100 points and get an idea of what's going on. There are, of course, a lot of numeric programs. This one is sine of x. It's a function from trigonometry and tells you about circles and triangles. As you can see, this is a very basic function to implement, as it's already built into NumPy. The hyperbolic tangent, tan h, is a fun function too, and we're going to look at it again later, since the derivative is also interesting. So, what is the derivative? Again, it's a concept from calculus that gives you the rate of change of a function. For a small change in the input, how much does the output change? A way to visualize this is that it is the slope of the graph at a point, the rise divided by the run. As we let the run get smaller and smaller, we look at what the rise is and look at their ratio. In calculus, we talk about the idea of a limit as the run goes to zero. You can see in the plot on the left, an idea of how the derivative might be calculated. We let the run get smaller and smaller, keep calculating that ratio, and then at every point along the line we could calculate that same ratio to figure out the slope. This is the derivative. Indeed, we can use this to quickly compute the derivative just using Python. We evaluate the function a small distance epsilon away, which I'm going to call the run. Then we calculate the rise, this is how much the function changes between x and x plus that small distance. So we return the slope, which is the rise divided by the run. Note also that this is a function that eats a function and outputs a function. The function it outputs answers the question, what is the rate of change at this point? It turns out that the derivative of x squared is 2x, and our approximation is pretty close to that. Here, we apply our function to the square function, so that the suggestively named 2x is a function itself, which is the approximate derivative of x squared. It turns out that you can compute the derivative of x squared to be 2 times x, and our approximation is pretty close to that. If you input 2, you'll get out 3.999. If you input negative 3, you'll get out negative 5.999. 
The goal of this talk, though, is not to teach you how to compute derivatives by hand, though I can assure you it's quite fun. It's almost the opposite of that. Automatic differentiation is a technique to automatically take an exact derivative. There are a few problems with our own implementation, including that it is an approximation and it does not scale well in higher dimensions. Automatic differentiation solves both of those problems. In fact, I should emphasize that second aspect, that it scales well in higher dimensions. In our previous implementation, if we had a function with a million parameters, which it's not unusual to have in deep learning, we would have to evaluate our function a million times in order to compute a derivative the way we did previously. Using automatic differentiation, we only need to evaluate the function once. This is a great saving in speed. So there are Python libraries you can use today to compute these exact derivatives in thousands or millions of dimensions. The goal of this talk is to give you some examples of how to do that and what you can do with the derivative. One example is the background of this slide, which is some computational art where I took a curve and drew the derivative going out forward from the direction of the travel. I think it's a fun example of what you can do with automatic differentiation. Before we get into higher dimensional versions of the derivative, I want to take a quick detour and show you what automatic differentiation looks like in practice. One library that implements automatic differentiation is called JAX, and here is how to compute the derivative of a function using the JAX library. The things you should notice here are that you're using a JAX version of NumPy. Sort of cheekily, they import JAX.NumPy as NP. It has an identical API to the more familiar NumPy, and where it doesn't, they consider that a bug. JAX also supplies a few more functions. Just like in our own implementation, the grad function will return the derivative of whatever it's handed. We're going to talk about what the gradient is in a moment, but for now, let's just assume that the grad function returns the derivative of whatever the input is. In keeping with JAX's goal of mimicking the NumPy API, JAX also plays well with plotting libraries like matplotlib. Remember earlier that I said that the output of our function ought to be a single number. I've actually been playing a little fast and loose with that in order to plot, but JAX will throw an exception if I pass a vector of numbers. JAX supplies another helper, vmap, which is short for vectorized map, that applies the gradient to each element in a vector. In the code example here, np.linspace provides a vector of numbers starting from negative two and going up to positive two. So I can pass that into a function like tan h, but I need to wrap the derivative of it with vmap so that the gradient gets applied pointwise to each element in the vector t. We can go ahead and plot this, and it's so easy. It lets us think about our problem instead of about how we implement our code. For example, we might notice from looking at this plot that our derivative is just a function. What happens if we apply grad to our derivative? Well, we'll get something called a second derivative. And it turns out that we can just keep on doing this by wrapping grad around the derivatives that we get. So here's the code to do that. We just keep on wrapping the grad function more. So f starts out as hyperbolic tangent, and we'll plot that. And then we set f to be equal to the gradient of itself. So we'll get a first derivative, a second derivative, and so on up to the fourth derivative. Once we plot it, here's how it looks. And this can be overwhelming. We might not be really thinking about what a fourth derivative means here. One way to get some intuition is that if your original function is increasing, we'll expect that the derivative will be positive. And if your original function is decreasing, we'll expect that the derivative will be negative. Higher derivatives talk about how quickly rates of changes are changing. As a brief aside, this is a wonderful clipping from the notices of the American Mathematical Society. It's pretty related to what we're doing here. Inflation is a rate of change in the spending value of money. So the rate of increase of inflation is our second derivative and then if that is decreasing, we're talking about a third derivative. I'm mainly using 
Jax today for code snippets and also for generating all the illustrations and animations, since it works great for these examples. But Python is a big ecosystem, and two other popular libraries implementing automatic differentiation are TensorFlow and PyTorch. These libraries target different use cases, and so the code looks somewhat different. In particular, taking the derivative of hyperbolic tangent looks a little awkward in both TensorFlow and PyTorch. These are two fantastic and extremely powerful libraries, though, and I hope you try them out, especially if you're interested in deep learning, which is a place where they really shine. TensorFlow is shown here, and it uses something called a gradient tape to watch operations as they happen, and then they take the derivative of those operations. So after we leave the context manager, we can ask the tape what the gradient of y with respect to t is. This is the plot. It looks ex exactly the same as the one from Jax, or the one we will see with PyTorch. The black line is the hyperbolic tangent, and the blue line is the derivative. Now PyTorch looks pretty similar to Jax, but we have to annotate the code in a few places to be really specific about what we are taking a derivative of and what size the output will be. You can see requires grad equals true. You can see some calls to dot detach, and then you can see the grad outputs uh, argument when we call grad on y and t. Again, this is the plot which is identical to the previous ones. Remember, these libraries are implementing the same collections of algorithms, so you can pick the one that best suits your need. We move on now to derivatives in higher dimensions. Some examples of numeric functions from higher dimensions include a topographic map, where each latitude-longitude pair corresponds to a height. We can think of this as a function from two dimensions to one dimension. So you input two numbers and you output one number. Pictured here is a map of the White Mountains in New Hampshire. The peak in white on the top right is Mount Washington, which is the highest point in New Hampshire, and a really beautiful hike. When we are doing data visualization, there are a few ways to show these plots. This is the White Mountains again, so you can really see the slopes of the mountains. Again, you can pick out Mount Washington in the top right, colored in white. We call the rate of a change of a function like this, a function from two dimensions to one dimension, the gradient. The gradient is still a function, and it still gives us the rate of change at a point, but we have to be a little more careful here. If you're standing on a mountainside, the slope will depend on what direction you're walking. If you walk uphill, downhill, or alongside the hill, the slope will be different. So, mechanically, a gradient returns a vector of numbers at each point, and if you take the dot product of those numbers with a direction, you get the rate of change in that direction. Change in that direction. So, the gradient gives us a rate of change in a direction at a point. Another example of a function from two dimensions to one dimension is a black and white image, where each point corresponds to the intensity of the image at that point. So here is a photo of my dog Pete, and I've converted him to grayscale so we can do some image processing with the gradient. It can be difficult to plot a gradient since each point corresponds to a vector. What we can do instead is to plot the magnitude of the gradient at each point how big the gradient vector is. This has a very cool interpretation in image processing as it can be used to find edges. In the places with a consistent color, like his spot or his white fur, the gradient is close to zero. And so we would plot a number like zero squared plus zero squared is equal to zero. But at the interface, the gradient becomes very large, something like 10 comma 10 and we'll get large values from the magnitude. It'd be like 10 squared plus 10 squared is 200. And so there we plot a darker line. You can see this on the right-hand side where you get a nice outline of Pete's spot. We can even overlay these edges on the original image and get a red outline around Pete, which is pretty nice. I want to finish with one of the most common uses of automatic differentiation, which is gradient descent. It turns out that while the gradient gives a rate of change, moving in the direction of the gradient is, locally, the fastest way uphill, and moving opposite the gradient is the fastest way downhill.
This fact shouldn't be obvious, but it's not terribly hard to prove. We'll use this result for the gradient descent algorithm. If you want to minimize a function, take a bunch of small steps in the direction opposite the gradient. You can see an example here. This is a one-dimensional function, so the gradient is just a number. But notice that the slope is positive, so at each step we move in the negative direction, that's toward the left. Eventually, we find this minimum near negative 0.5. This is almost easier to understand in higher dimensions. At each time step, we take a small step in the direction of steepest descent, which is given by the gradient, and eventually settle to what is at least a local minimum. This is a nice example because you can see that the path we take can curve since the gradient is only considering local information. So our point finds a small valley and then follows that valley down to the bottom of a larger valley. Gradient descent is a very easy algorithm to implement if you have automatic differentiation. Here is how a basic version works. We initialize our point somehow. That is x0. Next, we choose the step size, which I'm calling epsilon here, and setting to 1 times 10 to the negative 3. Then we take the gradient of our function, and this is the step that uses automatic differentiation. We should pause and think about all the time, work, and errors this is saving us. Without autodiff, we would have to stop here on the third line, take a gradient by hand, implement it in code, write unit tests, because we're definitely going to write unit tests, and then pass that function into the gradient descent function. So this is just wonderful. We can skip all that and just encapsulate it in a single line of code. After computing the gradient, we take a small step opposite from the direction given by the gradient and just repeat that for a while. Eventually, we return the point that we ended up at. Showing that this will work, or should approximately work, is not terribly hard. Optimization and gradient descent are areas of active research, though, and there are a lot of ways to improve this implementation. We can already see a few. One problem we might think about running into is that if we initialize our point in different spots, we might get different minimums. And the minimum we get might not be the global minimum. This is the same example we saw before, but I'm starting my point a little bit to the right of that peak instead of a little bit to the left. Gradient descent then sends that point down to a valley on the right-hand side, which is nowhere near as low as the valley on the left-hand side. This is a drawback to gradient descent, and you might think about how it's only using local information and it doesn't know anything about the function as a whole. We might also use our step size to be too big you can see this algorithm is jumping all over instead of settling into that big well. And that's because the step it's taking is too large, and so when it comes to any point with a large gradient, it's going to take a very big step and jump all the way over the well. This causes it to bounce around rather than settling into a minimum. I hope this serves as an introduction and invitation to automatic differentiation, and I look forward to seeing what creative uses Python community puts these libraries to.